it's a more enthusiastic uh, crowd today. Maybe we're getting closer to Thanksgiving. Or perhaps we're just getting closer to the second exam. Go figure, right? OK. Um, we are marching through signaling. And uh, we should uh, get most of the way through that, if not all the way through that today. And that will put us uh, pretty much on target where we need to be. Last time I talked about um, the beta adrenergic receptor and how it was activated and how its activation uh, started a series of events happening that resulted in the activation of protein kinase A. I kind of left it at protein kinase A, and for now we're going to leave it kind of hanging there. But you can imagine that since protein kinase A is active, that it can go and activate a bunch of other stuff. And so a lot of the things we'll be talking about in signaling is I'm only taking you to a certain point. All right? I'm not going to take you through all the way through the pathway because some of these pathways can take 30 or 40 steps. And I don't think you want to memorize all those. They're a resounding no there. Okay. So uh, suffice it to say that signaling can cause changes in enzymatic action. That's a lot of what protein kinase A does. Signaling can also cause changes in gene expression. Which genes are being turned on to be made, which ones are being turned off to be made, some, whether they're made or not. And some of the ones I'll be talking about today, in fact, several of the ones I'll be talking about today, ultimately affect gene expression. We're going to see one that affects trafficking in the cell. And that'll be an interesting one. That's the very, fir the very first one I'll talk about. OK. Well. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about the beta adrenergic receptor. I'm going to move on to uh, another signaling system. And in fact, everything I'll be talking about today involves signaling systems. This signaling system involves activation of an enzyme called phospholipase C. Okay? Now, I don't go through the whole uh, l l range of steps for this. It's, it's rather involved. But suffice it to say that phospholipase C is present normally in cells in an inactive state. It's an enzyme. Signaling through a 7TM receptor activates a G protein that activates phospholipase C. Okay? So just like we saw before, just like we saw before, the uh, activation of an enzyme is made possible by activation of a G protein. Yes, it is a different G protein than we saw before. There are quite a variety of G proteins that are present in cells. And the exact names of them are not critical for our purposes. Okay? So the 7TM activates a G protein. The G protein activates phospholipase C. Okay? Phospholipase C, as I said, is an enzyme. And it catalyzes this reaction that you, can, that you see right here. It starts with this membrane compound. This compound is embedded in the membrane. All right? The lipid bilayer has a nonpolar end and a polar end, and this molecule has a nonpolar end and a polar end. So it fits very nicely in the lipid bilayer. This molecule is called PIP2. Okay? PIP2 is a uh, fairly abundant component of the lipid membrane. Okay? PIP2 has uh, a backbone of glycerol. That's what that is there, carbon, carbon, carbon. Two of the carbons are attached to fatty acids. And one of the carbons is attached to this phosphoinositol. Okay? The action of phospholipase C is to clip the phosphoinositol off of the rest of the molecule. So that's what we see down here. So the, the, the phosphoinositol has been split off of the rest of the molecule. Now, the rest of the molecule, this tail was embedded in the lipid bilayer. It remains embedded in the lipid bilayer. This phosphoinositol is very polar. It's no longer attached to this molecule in the lipid bilayer. And the phos this uh, IP3, which is a, a, a form of phosphoinositol, is soluble in the cytoplasm, and it leaves the membrane. So it moves inwards into the cell. Now, we'll see how this acts in a minute. So to summarize, phospholipase C cleaves PIP2 to yield IP3. And the remaining molecule is called diacylglycerol, D-A-G. I'll probably call it just DAG. All right? Now, it turns out that both DAG 
and IP3 are second messengers. They're both second messengers. We'll see how that happens in the next slide. OK, so we've had signaling. It's activated a G protein. The G, it's activated a membrane receptor. The receptor is activated a G protein. The G protein is activated phospholipase C. And now we're going to see what happens uh, with this um, process. This schematically now shows you this signaling pathway that I've started describing to you. Okay? Phospholipase C has become active. Phospholipase C recognizes PIP2 in the membrane, and it clips PIP2. All right? uh, it, it, clips, it, it clips the IP3 off of PIP2. IP3 leaves the membrane, and it goes to the endoplasmic reticulum or a, a, a specialized form of it known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Either are equivalent for what I'm uh, going to be saying here. Okay? So IP3 leaves after it's been clipped and travels to a receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum. The effect of the binding of IP3 to this receptor is to open the receptor. And the opening of the receptor allows the calcium ions that are stored in the endoplasmic reticulum or sarcoplasmic reticulum to leak out. That causes an increase in calcium in the cytoplasm. And that increase in calcium in the cytoplasm can bind to protein kinase C. It's a different protein kinase than before. Now, protein kinase C can bind to two things. One is it can bind to calcium. So you've seen the calcium now. Interestingly, the second thing it binds to is DAG. So in a sense, calcium is almost like what I would call a third messenger. Your book categorizes it as a second messenger, and that's fine for our purposes. But um, it's acting as a third in the sequence, essentially. Now, calcium and DAG together activate protein kinase C. All right? So protein kinase C is, a, um, is a, an enzyme. And this enzyme can phosphorylate other proteins. And in phosphorylating other proteins, it brings about the effects. That may affect gene expression. That may affect enzymatic activity. It may affect a variety of things. But suffice it to say that the response is this. Now, how does this fit into a bigger scheme? Well, we have to understand a little bit about muscles. This process actually occurs in smooth muscles, like in your, uh, in your veins. Okay? One of the activators of this signaling pathway is a hormone known as angiotensin. Angiotensin is involved in regulating blood pressure. Okay? Now, what I, if you've had physiology, uh, you may know this. If you haven't, I'll tell you. But calcium is an important signaling molecule for muscle contraction. Calcium actually stimulates and is required for muscle contraction. OK? Well, normally, calcium in the cell is kept at a very, very low concentration. And the reason it's kept at a low concentration is because calcium is actually poisonous to your chromosomes. Calcium at too high of a level will cause your chromosomes to precipitate. That's not a good career move for your cells. So the cells sequester calcium. That's why you see it sequestered down here. For the most part, they don't allow too much free calcium to be out. So even a tiny amount coming out can have a drastic effect on a signaling system like this. It can also stimulate muscular contraction. Now, since angiotensin plays a role in controlling smooth muscles around your veins, you now see how angiotensin can play a role then in helping to regulate blood pressure by this contraction that it's actually stimulating through this process. Now, there are other things that can happen as a result of action of protein kinase C. So I don't want to leave it as if that's the only thing that this can do. There are other things that can happen. Protein kinase C can then phosphorylate proteins that results in, result in changes in, in uh, gene expression. Okay? And as I said, I'm not going to talk about those. But suffice it to say, this signaling pathway is changing what the cell was doing compared to before the hormone bound to the receptor. Yes, sir? So 
Uh, this can happen in other cells. I'm giving this as an example in smooth muscles. Uh -huh. OK. Other questions? Yes? Do DAG and IP3 both have to bind? Now, uh, IP3 doesn't bind, uh, you're talking about here? Uh, yeah. No, so it's calcium and, and DAG that both bind. It is calcium and DAG both, yes. Uh huh. Yes, sir? Does binding of calcium increase, increase the affinity of, for binding to DAG? Is that, is that the question? Um, I can't tell you if, if, which one's first. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. Uh, yeah, for our purposes, both, it takes both ultimately to get this activation to happen. Okay? Okay. So you're, what you see in signaling is, is something like what we're going to see in metabolism eventually. This goes to this, goes to this, goes to this, goes to this. Okay? And yes, I think the steps are important. Okay? So you should be able to describe to me if I said, what happens in, seven to, in, in activation of uh, the beta adrenergic receptor. You should be able to tell me the steps. If I say what happens in the activation of phospholipase C, I think you should be able to tell me the steps. If you want to, in answering the question, draw the steps, that's fine too. But whatever you do in answering a question like that, you make sure that we understand what you're doing. If you're not a very good artist, words might be better. Okay? Okay. Okay. Um, Calcium is a problem uh, because, as I said, calcium, uh, too much calcium in the cell causes problems for DNA. So cells keep calcium concentrations around the chromosomes artificially low uh, so that it doesn't encounter that problem. Calcium has some fairly drastic effects inside of cells. One of them you saw in that figure I was showing you there before I clicked it off, simply that it can be coordinated by uh, a variety of things. This shows coordination of a calcium with an aspartic acid, a glutamic acid, another aspartic acid, and a water molecule. And you'll say, well, whoa, there's one, two, three minuses and, and sort of a, another minus up there. Aren't you overwhelming the calcium? These are coordinated, okay? So it's not balancing charge. It's the positives attracting the negative, And that's basically all that's happening there. This becomes important when we consider um, how calcium uh, binds to proteins. So one of the proteins that, are, that calcium binds to commonly in cells is known as calmodulin. And I want to say just a few words about calmodulin. Okay? Calmodulin is a, it derives its name from the fact that uh, cal, referring to calcium, modulin, referring to modulating. So this, pro this protein modulates both the level of calcium and the actions of calcium inside of cells. Calmodulin is a fairly abundant protein in our cells, and it has a very important function. Remember I said that too much calcium is a problem. One of the things that this protein does is it gobbles up calcium. Now, if all it did was gobble up calcium, then calcium signaling wouldn't make much sense. There wouldn't be an awful lot of things for, to, to happen with that. Okay? Well, it turns out that calmodulin, when it binds to calcium, is a protein that changes its shape considerably upon binding. I'll show you a figure in a minute. We can think of that change in shape as sort of activating or inactivating calmodulin. Why is that important? Because calmodulin can in turn bind to other proteins and turn them on or off. So now if calmodulin has a, a calcium bound, it looks one way. If it doesn't have calcium bound, it looks a, a different way. That difference can determine whether it binds to another target protein or not. In other words, calmodulin is telling the target protein, hey, calcium is present. So therefore, we don't have to raise calcium levels so high. Calmodulin does the work for us, telling, it, telling the proteins that it needs to that calcium is present. Okay? Let's look at what happens. Okay? The binding of calcium by calmodulin converts calmodulin uh, from looking like this guy right here, okay, to a much more bent structure like this guy over here. Okay? We see some significant changes happening on the binding and rearrangement of this to uh, uh, form a different form of calmodulin. Because it's in the new form, it's capable of interacting with another protein that it wasn't capable of interacting with before. Therefore, calcium being present 
was communicated to this other enzyme that, hey, there's calcium present, we've got to do something, and this other enzyme will become active or inactive as a result of binding to calmodulin. Now, we'll see other examples later, at least one other example later, of calmodulin doing a very similar thing to another important enzyme in metabolism. But calmodulin has this effect on many different enzymes. So the binding of calcium causes calmodulin to participate in that signaling process and turn on or turn off target enzymes as appropriate. Does that make sense? Stunned silence, I guess. Okay. All right. Yeah. Does it require all four calciums for that to happen? That's correct, it does. Uh -huh. So there's four calciums that involved in that process. Now, uh, one of the things I should point out about calmodulin, this is true, there are other proteins besides calmodulin that bind calcium. So I don't want to leave you the impression calmodulin is the only one. There are others that bind calcium. Calcium binding proteins tend to have a common structure. And the common structure they have is called an EF hand. It's kind of like it's depicted on the screen, where the calcium actually binds in this little pocket right in here. The calcium binding proteins all have that common structure called an EF hand. And as you saw in the case of calmodulin, the binding of that calcium can, in fact, cause that EF hand to change. So we're seeing a change in shape, but the common structure that they're binding is called an EF hand. Yeah? So our question is, can calcium signal in the absence of a protein? And the answer is, yes, it can. You just saw an example with protein kinase C, for example. So why do you need these proteins to be So our question is, why do you need these proteins? As I said, this protein helps to keep the calcium concentration relatively low all right, and still communicate a signal. Right? So it's not like every protein uses calmodulin. They don't. So you do have some free calcium that's getting through that's making a signal. But this helps keep that concentration from getting too high so there's not a problem. Yes, sir? No, chem kinase is an enzyme that calmodulin is affecting. So that interaction between calmodulin and chem kinase is either turning on or turning off chem kinase. It depends on the enzyme. Okay? But that interaction will happen only when calmodulin has bound to calcium. It won't happen when calmodulin has not bound to calcium. So we can think of the calmodulin almost as like an adapter. Right? It's an adapter. Once I've got that, I've bound it, now it fits into other things, all right? And that's what the calmodulin is doing. Okay. All right. So we're zipping right along here. Let's turn our attention to um, uh, another set of signaling pathways. And the signaling pathways I'm going to talk about now do not, underline do not, involve 7TMs. So we're going to leave the 7TMs behind, and yes, there are many, many 7TM signaling pathways. We're going to leave those behind, and we're going to talk about another interesting class of pathways. Okay? These are pathways that are, have a common feature of dimerization all right, as part of the signaling. Dimerization. So dimerization means two things working together. There's two big examples I'll show you. The first of these is the um, insulin receptor. Okay? Now, what you see on the screen is not the insulin receptor, but instead the hormone insulin itself. Insulin is a hormone. It's a peptide hormone. It's a peptide hormone made by our pancreas. And it's made in response to high concentrations of glucose that arise from having had a Coca-Cola, a bunch of French fries, something in our diet that's carbohydrate rich. As I'll talk ad nauseum about, glucose in the body is a poison. The body cannot tolerate high levels of glucose, of free glucose. So whenever it encounters increasing concentrations of glucose, it does something to reduce those levels of glucose. And one of the things it uses to reduce the levels of glucose is insulin. Insulin stimulates target cells to take glucose out of the bloodstream and into themselves. And you said, well, if it's a poison, why is it taking it into themselves? And the answer is, once it gets it into themselves, it converts it into something else. Okay? So effectively, insulin 
lowers the level of blood glucose. Now you s sort of knew that glucose was a poison. You never thought about it before, but glucose is a poison. One of the problems that happens with diabetes are results from that poison of glucose. Okay? People who don't modulate and can't modulate their glucose levels appropriately may go blind, they may get, have amputations, they may have severe health problems arising from that. Yes, ma'am? Uh, what about, um, well, we make glucose, right, from uh, our glycogen in our liver. Mm -hmm. So what about the people with diabetes? Um, do they still make the, the glucose from their glycogen? Okay, so our question is, uh, if glucose is a poison, we, have to, we do release it from glycogen and so forth. Do people with diabetes have that problem? The answer is no, they don't have a problem releasing glucose for the most part. Uh, from their glycogen, and no, we don't get our glucose levels down to zero either, okay? So we need a certain level of glucose because glucose is an energy source. So with glucose, we've got a yin and yang. We've got something that we need, but we get too much of it, we've got a problem. How many people ever can anything, like jellies? Okay, the reason you put so darn much sugar in there is to kill everything in it. It's true. That's why you can leave a jar of jelly sitting out on the counter for a long time before it goes bad. It will go bad, but it's not like if you leave eggs out on the counter for a few hours in the potato salad, right? Very different kind of a thing. So that glucose really is a poison. Okay, well, I'll talk more about that later, but let's get back to talking now about this signaling system. So glucose, uh, so insulin is a hormone. And it's a hormone that's telling cells, take up glucose. We're going to see how that works. Insulin hormone works through, not surprisingly, something called the insulin receptor. And the insulin receptor is a protein in the membrane of target cells, just like you saw with the 7TM. The insulin receptor is a protein in the cell membrane of target cells. The insulin receptor looks like this. It actually starts out as a dimer, but it starts out as an inactive dimer. This dimer doesn't do anything all by itself. It just sits there as a dimer. Okay? These two units are attracted to each other. They sit there in the membrane talking to each other, and that's about all they do. They don't do anything else. One half of the dimer is on the left, one half of the dimer is on the right. You'll see each half of the dimer has an alpha subunit that's on the outside of the cell and a beta subunit that is on the inside of the cell. Now each of these subunits have a specialized function. The alpha subunit's function is to recognize and bind to insulin. The beta subunit's function, as we'll see, is an enzyme. And we'll see why that's critical in just a minute. The enzyme that is part of the beta subunit is also a kinase, okay? A kinase. So the kinase, as you recall, were enzymes that put phosphates onto things. The kinases I talked about before are what, we're, are what we refer to as threonine serine kinases, meaning they put phosphates onto serine and threonine, okay? So for example, the uh, um, protein kinase A, is a serine threonine kinase. Protein kinase C is a serine threonine kinase. It puts phosphates onto serine and threonine. This kinase puts phosphates onto tyrosines. And consequently, we call it a tyrosine receptor kinase. Now, tyrosine re receptor kinases play very important roles in controlling gene expression. This guy's involved in a lot of things. The one I'm going to talk about is not going to be gene expression directly, um, but it, does, it, it also does affect gene expression. Okay. Well, what happens in the activation of the insulin receptor? Okay. That's shown schematically in this figure right here. So let me lead you through it. The insulin receptor has bound insulin. The binding of insulin causes a shape change. You've heard this how many times this term now? Causes a shape change inside of the insulin receptor itself. Before that shape change occurred, the insulin receptor 
was the, the tyrosine kinase was inactive. It could not phosphorylate anything. But this shape change actually caused, and this is kind of odd, a portion of one side of the receptor to stick a tyrosine into the active site of the other receptor. So the shape change caused literally a substrate, that is a tyrosine, from one of the receptors to stick itself into the active site of the other. Well, when the enzyme is forced in that way, guess what happens? The kinase puts a phosphate onto the tyrosine. That causes several things to happen. It causes the other, it causes the receptor that had the that gets the phosphate onto it to become much more active and start phosphorylating the other receptor. So they sort of phosphorylate each other back and forth. That gives a variety of phosphotyrosines on each of those. So that very first phosphorylation sets in motion a series of phosphorylations of tyrosines on each receptor. The net product of that is that the dimer now has phosphates or phosphotyrosines all over it. That phosphotyrosine is attractive to a protein called IRS1. And IRS1 binds to one of those phosphotyrosines, seen right here. It also binds to PIP up here in the membrane. So this guy ends up being, this IRS1 ends up being fairly membrane bound, just like the receptor itself. It's anchored there at the membrane. Well, with this IRS1 sitting right next to this tyrosine kinase, guess what the tyrosine kinase does to it? It phosphorylates it. So these guys, these phosphotyrosines, arise from phosphorylation by the receptor. Yeah, it's kind of involved. The phosphotyrosines are targets for binding of another protein. That's an enzyme, phosphoinositide 3 kinase. Yes, the phosphotyrosines in the IRS1 are binding sites for another enzyme known as phosphoinositide 3 kinase. Okay? Now, a lot of times students tell me they don't like to memorize the name of that one. So I've in the past decided we would call it um, a, a different name. So I'm open to suggestions. What should we call that enzyme? You guys are not very imaginative. <laughs> Jeff, I like it. This shall henceforth in this class be known as Jeff. OK? I shall inform the TAs that if you give this answer, you, add, you call this thing Jeff, you will be counted correct. OK? Now, if you leave this class and you tell people this is Jeff, just forget where, I, where you learned that, OK? <laughs> They'll come and have my head examined. So Jeff is attracted to IRS-1. It should be fun, shouldn't it? Shouldn't this be fun? That's being so boring. OK. So Jeff is binding to a phosphotyrosine. And Jeff actually has on it, <laughs> you like this? <laughs> this is good. We should, have, we should name more things like this. This would be great. It's kind of like, you know, they say you should teach your children all the wrong words, you know? Wouldn't this be a great joke to play on your kids, you know? Rock is dog, right? <laughs> It'd be very cool, you know? The kid grows up and it goes, <laughs> <laughs> you're petting the rock or something? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Now, Jeff has a binding site that's found in many proteins that recognize a phosphotyrosine. Jeff has something called an SR2 domain. SR2 domain. An SR2 domain is simply a portion of a protein that recognizes a phosphotyrosine. And it's a common feature of many phosphotyrosine binding proteins. Jeff has an SR2 domain. You'll see Jeff is also binding to PIP2. You can see that right there. So again, fairly tightly anchored to the membrane. 
Well, our story's not done, all right? The reason it's important this guy be anchored to the membrane is Jeff is an enzyme, and Jeff can cleave, I'm sorry, not cleave, it adds a phosphate to PIP2 to make PIP3. That is, it adds a phosphate, so it goes from two phosphates to three, therefore becomes PIP3. That's what's shown here. PIP3, yeah, signaling is kind of complicated, isn't it? PIP3 is a binding site for another enzyme known as PDK1. PDK1 is a kinase, and it can phosphorylate AKT. Wow. Am I going to have to know all this? Yes, you're going to need to know this, unfortunately. All right. I'm going to give you the big picture in a minute. We're getting to the climax here. Now, activated AKT goes out and phosphorylates a bunch of things. One of the things it phosphorylates affects trafficking in the cell. Trafficking, you remember, controls the movement of proteins across the cell. And one of the proteins it affects is called GLUT4, G-L-U-T. GLUT stands for glucose transporter. So what's happening is the activation of this pathway is causing GLUT4 to move from the cytoplasm to the membrane. That's the big picture. GLUT4 being a glucose transport protein, when it goes to the membrane, guess what it does? It facilitates the transport of glucose in. This is how insulin is stimulating cells to take up sugar. It's a multi-step pathway. Don't lose the forest for the trees. The forest is that insulin is stimulating the movement of GLUT4 to the cell membrane to bring in glucose. That reduces the blood concentration of glucose and keeps you from poisoning yourself. Make sense? Yes? Uh, what's the interaction between the activated AKT and the GLUT4? The interaction is it's more complicated than what I said. So there are several things that get phosphorylated that result in a change in trafficking. And that's, I just want to leave it at that. Okay. But suffice it to say that that change in trafficking results in, the ch in the, the, uh, a change in destination. GLUT4 has moved from the cytoplasm up to the, um, the membrane. Yes, sir? Okay, so when PIP3 binds to, when PDK1 binds to PIP3, okay, then it becomes activated, which now causes AKT to gain a phosphate because uh, PDK1 is a kinase. So activate. It phosphorylates AKT. It phosphorylates AKT, that's right. Okay. Clear as mud? Everybody see the forest? We haven't done a joke in a while. Would you guys like a joke? Okay. All right. So this is my, my favorite genie joke, okay? So there's this um, guy, he's walking along. He just got out of BB450, OK? He's walking right out front here. This happened last, last term, so I know about this, OK? He's walking out in front of here, and he looks down, and there's this beautiful uh, bottle there. And he picks it up, and of course, once he picks it up, this genie pops out of the bottle, OK? And you know, oh, master, you may have you know, three wishes. And so he says, oh. Well, this is wonderful. He says, you know, I'm a poor college student, so um, I want to have a lot of money. Okay? And so the, the genie goes, poof! And the certificate appears in his hands, and it says he has a billion dollars in a Swiss bank account. That's not the punchline. <laughs> but, I, but hold that, and we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> That's the best response I've ever had for this joke. <laughs> Got the gift certificate. Got the, got, got the, got the certificate, right? A billion dollars in a Swiss bank account. This is awesome, right? He says, well, OK, so I've got that. He says, um, I want to be a very powerful man. Poof! The certificate appears in his hands and says he is the CEO of Apple Computer and Microsoft. <laughs> 
wow, man, I control the world with this thing. This is really where all the power is now. So he's got two wishes down, and he sits there and scratches. He said, well, let's see, I've got money, I've got power. Okay, I want every woman on earth to love me. Poof, he turns into a box of chocolates. <laughs> you thought it was dirty, didn't you? <laughs> I didn't hear you laugh at that. <laughs> okay. Have you guys heard that joke before? No? Okay. Okay. All right. Not to be sexist here. All right. And I'm looking at my figure and I realize I just gave you the wrong name. I said an SR2. It's, 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 it, it actually is a protein called SR, but it's, it's actually called the SH2 domain. I apologize. The, the protein it's named for is called SARC, S-R-C. So where I said SR2, it should be SH2. SH stands for SARC homology protein 2. My mind wasn't working. All right, so SH2 domains are common structural features of proteins that recognize phosphotyrosines. Very important structural features of proteins that recognize phosphotyrosines. Okay, uh, let's see, what do I want to say there? Nothing there. That was Jeff, by the way, in case you're wondering what Jeff was doing. Now, this in words tells you what I showed you in the figure. So for those of you who um, perhaps aren't good artists, that's a pretty good uh, description of what uh, was happening right there. Okay, well, uh, I'm gonna finish this afternoon talking about uh, another signaling pathway that involves dimerization. In this case, the dimer actually forms, and this pathway is very important for stimulating cells to divide. As you might imagine, this pathway is important consideration in processes involving cancer. It's not only involved, Gesundheit, it's not only involved in cancer, but it's also involved in just normal cellular division. Cells use hormones as a way of signaling to each other, hey, it's time to divide. So during growth and development, okay, Stimulating cells to divide is obviously very important to do because you are growing. Well, this um, system I'm going to describe to you is stimulated by a hormone known as the epidermal growth factor. The epidermal growth factor, or EGF. It's also a peptide hormone. Because then, hey, this is a big day for sneezing, isn't it? And not surprisingly, the epidermal growth factor binds to a receptor that looks like, okay, the anticipation I know is there, all right, the looks, binds to a receptor that looks like this, okay? The receptor is the yellow guy. Now, this is different than the way that the insulin receptor works. So I need to describe this to you briefly. The epidermal growth factor receptor does not normally exist as a dimer. When I drew that insulin receptor for you, you saw it dimerized without insulin being there. The EGF receptor does not do that. It's normally present as a monomer. Only when it has bound to EGF does it dimerize. Okay. The insulin receptor starts out as a dimer. It changes shape on binding insulin, but it's, it's already a dimer by that point. EGF starts out as a monomer, and only after binding of e to EGF does it dimerize. Gesundheit again, okay? Now, EGF receptor, like the insulin receptor, is also a tyrosine protein kinase, okay? It's also a tyrosine receptor protein kinase. That means that it starts out with an inactive tyrosine kinase. The dimerization does something very similar. It forces together a tyrosine into an active site that wasn't there before. <clears throat> that causes a phosphate to get put onto one of these guys, and they then turn around and phosphorylate the heck out of each other, stimulating both of them to be active. This results in the, the addition of several phosphotyrosines, 
to each of the monomeric units of the dimer. And like we saw in the insulin receptor, there are proteins that recognize those phosphotyrosines that do, in fact, have SH2 domains, one of the first of which is GERB2. GERB2 binds not only to the EGF receptor, it also binds to a protein called SOS. And though that sounds like trouble, it's not trouble necessarily. You'll notice that the interaction does not involve a phosphotyrosine. It involves another domain called SH3. Okay? So the interaction between these two guys, that's an SH3 domain that's on the GERB2. So GERB2 has both an SH2 over here on the left and SH3s on the right. SH3s are binding something besides phosphotyrosine. They're not binding phosphotyrosine. They're actually binding prolines. This binding of SOS brings into play another protein called RAS. Now, RAS binds to, to SOS, and this binding of all of this causes SOS to change so that, guess what? It replaces the GDP in RAS with GTP. Where have you heard that before? In G proteins, right? RAS is like a G protein. In fact, it's structurally similar to G proteins. It carries guanine nucleotides just like a G protein. But RAS has other things that it does, and they're very interesting. You might guess over here, especially because it says so right there, if it didn't say so right there, you might guess that RAS is activated by the replacement of GDP by GTP. And it is. What does activation of RAS do? RAS is a, an activated RAS is a signal to the cell that it's time to divide. Now there's a whole bunch of steps that are involved in going from RAS to ultimately the division of a cell. There's gene expression, there's proteins that have to be made, enzymes that have to be made, nucleotides that have to be made. But RAS is one of the proteins that, when it's activated, can stimulate the cell to start that process so the division itself will ultimately happen. This is very important because the cell has gotten a signal from outside that says it's time to divide. This information has been communicated inwards, and RAS is now going to start that division process. Yes, ma'am? Can one activated RAS do it, or does it take many activated RAS? Can one activated RAS do it, or can it take many? The answer is, generally, it's going to take more than one, yes. Did I see a question over here? Now, like G proteins, RAS also is a very bad enzyme. What do you suppose it does? it breaks down GTP down to GDP, just like we saw the G proteins did. Okay? It's fairly slow at doing that, and because it's slow, that allows that activation pathway to get started. Now, there's an extra wrinkle with respect to RAS, and I'm going to explain it to you right now. Questions before I explain the wrinkle to you? Everybody know what's going on? Yeah. Yeah, the two sides are essentially identical. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, question up here. Does this have uh, anchored things in a membrane? Is that the question? Yeah, this isn't absolutely tied to the membrane, but because the, me the receptor itself is, this all will occur at the membrane. Yes. Okay. It turns out RAS itself um, is uh, rather membrane bound. It has a, a fatty acid that's linked to it, but I, that gets a little bit more complicated than I want to get into here. Okay, now, what's the wrinkle? Well, the wrinkle is in the enzymatic nature of RAS. All right? RAS is an example of a protein we refer to as an oncogene. An oncogene you've probably heard of. An oncogene, you probably heard, is a protein that causes cancer. Probably the simple way it was explained to you. All right? 
And I'll say more about that next time. But suffice it to say that RAS is itself implicated in cancer. Not when it's RAS, but rather when it's been mutated. OK? So the mutated, there's a mutated form of RAS that is very implicated in the development of cancer. Now, let's think about what that mutation might involve. I could actually ask you to predict it, and I'll wager about 10% of you would actually get it right now. The mutation affects the ability of RAS to cleave GTP to GDP. If RAS can't cleave GTP back down to GDP, what's going to happen to RAS once it gets a GTP? It's going to stay activated, and it's going to tell the cell, divide, 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 divide. There's not going to be a turn off of that signal. Okay? That is one way to form a cancer. Now, the scary thing about that, and there is a very scary component to that, the scary thing about that is that the mutation that causes that to happen can happen with the change of a single base pair. One single base pair can convert RAS from being a regular GTPase, meaning it breaks down GTP, into something that can't break down GTP. When we start thinking about environmental pollutants, which increase the likelihood we will mutate our DNA, we start thinking, oh my goodness, I sure hope it's not that one nucleotide in RAS. That's oh, okay, I've got a one in seven billion chance it's going to happen, right? Yep, except for the fact that I've got how many trillion cells? I've got thousands of those that are probably potentially happening at any given time. The more I'm exposed to things that favor mutation, the more likely I'm going to cause a RAS to be activated to uncontrollably cause cells to divide. Now, there are many things that are involved in the formation of a tumor. Okay? It's not fully understood all of the steps. But at least in mice, it's been shown that you can take and change one base of RAS and make a tumor. I'll plant that sobering thought in your head as you go out and breathe our polluted air. Anything, anything that favors mutation. So when you hear about mutagens, tanning booths, smoking, polluted water, so polluted like air. Food and stuff like that. I'm sorry. Processed foods. And um, yeah, I don't know the processed foods are necessarily mutagens, but they may well contain mutagens, so it would be a, a concern. Hey, Andy. It worked beautifully today, by the way. Again, um, I'm finding if I leave that volume turned down, it really works nicely. So. How are you doing?